Good evening, fabulous ladies at home. I'm Dr. Melanie Ohalski, reproductive endocrinologist and certified menopause practitioner. And I'm here with the fabulous Dr. Kelsey Steele, who is back by popular demand to do another menopause chat with us. Thank you, Dr. Steele, for joining us today. Absolutely, I love it every time. Mm. We're like a, a team trouble here because we're <laughs> talking about all the exciting things we're going to be discussing tonight. Um, tonight's topic is menopause and the emotional roller coaster. And the reason why um, this topic is, I think, particularly important is because I think we all go through phases in our life where we may have some mood changes. And mood disorders can occur anytime in life, but we do see an increase during the perimenopause and menopause transition, um, during which patients are reporting mood changes and, um, and having some negative effects from those mood changes. So tonight we want to talk about why that may happen, when someone should seek care and or evaluation and um, what some treatment options can include. And Dr. Kelsey Steele is a certified psychologist and um, we have done we have done webinars and lectures before. Um, and as always, we want to invite the audience to um, participate as much as possible. There is, um, an, there is a feature where you can type in your question and we will try to get to all of the questions that we can. If there are any that we can't address, we will try to reach out and um, get you some answers um, as long as it's something that is answerable. Um, so how's that sound <laughs> perfect okay so it is very common that a patient will come to me and say i feel like i'm going crazy but i just don't feel myself like things are agitating me and i it it, it it's not it's not typical for me so i'm, I'm not feeling normal is this is this hormones or something else going on? Um, another complaint is, I love my family, but I can't, like, or, or my coworkers are great, but they are really getting under my nerves and um, I just, I'm normally not this irritable. Um, so I think one of the important take home messages of tonight is that mood changes are a very common piece of the menopause changes that happen in the perimenopause and menopause. And when I talk about perimenopause, I'm referring to the approximate 10 years that precede when you would get your last period and be officially menopausal. And the perimenopause is just as important as the menopause because there are a lot of hormonal changes that often can come before we even see changes in your period. So you might not otherwise be aware that hormonal changes are happening, but that's a time when mood changes can start to occur. So when I have a patient who is um, talking about uh, having mood changes, it's, it's normal, but it's something that needs to be addressed if it's causing distress to to the patient, to, to the, the, the woman, or if it's affecting relationships. If, I mean, I, I, it's not uncommon that I have a patient say, I almost lost my job because, you know, things that you used to be able to bite your tongue over, you just, you don't have that reserve anymore. Um, so the first thing I'll ask is, is everything else in your life and health okay? One of the biggest things that can really exacerbate mood is poor sleep. Um, and there's a lot of reasons why sleep gets disturbed during this time. I think the top three would be hot flashes, 
Um, and sometimes they can occur pretty infrequently. So you don't even, you know, really notice that you might think, oh, I just, I'm a little, you know, my pajamas are a little wet. Um, and so, but hot flashes can be really disruptive. Um, two, I have to go to the bathroom. So I'm waking up every night to, to use the bathroom. And three would be, I don't know why I wake up. I just, I feel like at 3 a.m. or 4 a.m., my mind is, you know, I'm thinking about everything I need to do that day. And, um, and so to that, to that end, if, if Dr. Steele, when you have a patient who is feeling as though um, she knows that her sleep is disturbed, what are some of the things that you think about when you're trying to help that patient? This is a really potentially loaded question, right? Because so many <laughs> things impact, so many things impact sleep. Um, but realistically, it's that piece of, you know, people really want to fight their sleep often, right? Like we want to really um, say, okay, I'm going to go to bed at this time, even if we're not tired. Like we try to create a routine, which is very helpful for sleep. But if we're not feeling tired and we're trying to force ourselves, it's not going to be super helpful, right? If, if somebody's up and recognizing what time what time it is let's say it's 11 p.m and there's somebody that goes to bed around 9 30 10 it's 11 and they're still doing tasks because they're not tired and now they're frustrated fighting sleep is not going to help right mm. um but coming up with a good nighttime routine realistically of which means turning off phones right i don't know how many people are in bed either on their phone tablets computers tvs so much activity happens in the bed um, outside of just sleep or sex and that can just that can really disrupt sleep um other options or you know that good nighttime routine would be like not drinking any caffeine past a certain time of day mm -hmm. really making sure that we're limiting water intake or any type of food consumption something that's going to give us energy right like nighttime snacking things like that we really want to reduce so we're not energizing ourselves right before we're trying to go to sleep. And I know this, but how often right before bed do I need to snack on those darn cookies and stuff? So mm -hmm. it's good to hear you say these things. Mm -hmm. um, and others really trying to kind of next day prepare to, right? So if we're feeling really tired because we didn't get a good night's sleep, we wake up, we're already thinking about how today is going to be terrible right we didn't sleep well we're grouchy it's already going to be a stressful day so maybe we get off early and we want to take a nap like definitely not super great just because the more rest we take during the day it's going to push back our ability to go to sleep at night mm -hmm. which is going to just perpetuate sleep cycles that that can become really unhealthy okay mm -hmm. What strategy would you use for um, that that patient who is waking up? She doesn't really know why, so she has no trouble falling asleep. But those um, that persistent wake up at three a.m. and you don't really know why, but you're thinking of X, Y, Z. Um, is there? Do you? So one of the things that I I talk to patients about, um, but I'm curious what you would say, is rather than get frustrated that, oh no, now I'm asleep, now I'm awake and I, I'm not going to be able to fall asleep forever, I'm going to be tired tomorrow, and then you kind of escalate, mm -hmm. and now you're really like, not only are you awake, but you're angry and stressed, mm -hmm. um, just kind of acknowledge, I'm awake, but it's okay, and, you know, try to relax yourself and, and hopefully ease back into sleep some strategy i think that's a really good strategy is the more negatively we think about it the harder it will be to go back to sleep right because then that's when we start fighting ourselves and that's when we just wake ourselves back up and then that that's how we're going to start our day is frustrated and it's going to really pour into the rest of everything else um some strategy so like some treatment for like sleep disorders or things like this would really say to not lay in bed for more than about 15 or 20 minutes, mm -hmm. which probably feels very contradictory to wanting to go to sleep. Mm -hmm. But the more that we lay there fighting with ourselves, wanting to go you know, to sleep, 
we're tossing and turning and now we're starting to build associations negatively of, oh, what am I gonna do here, right? I'm just gonna lay here, I'm gonna toss and turn. My partner's just sleeping soundly and that just irritates you even <laughs> yes, more, yes. right? When you're tossing and turning. Um, so doing, you know, it might be helpful to get out of bed, not do anything that's super entertaining. Don't go turn on your favorite show or read your favorite book, right? Um, but do something a little bit relaxing to kind of bring your body back down. And then when you start to feel tired, going back to bed to try to lay down. Yes, mm -hmm. that's good. That's good advice. I used to, I, I had a friend who, whenever she would wake up, she would just start like ironing or doing these. She got a lot done <laughs> in the middle of the night. Mm -hmm. um, but but probably that's not a good idea. Something a little more mundane mm -hmm. to, to ease you back in. Mm -hmm. You don't want to turn on a whole bunch of lights and do a whole bunch of things that are going to stimulate. to stimulate exactly. You know, for somebody that can fall asleep to the TV or something to where that's not problematic, that's fine. You know, we don't want to disrupt people's natural coping skills of being able to do these things. But recognizing that threshold of like, okay, I can have something on or do this activity without it actually like waking me more up and, and being exactly that stimulating. Yeah. And just to kind of bring this back to our theme tonight of the emotional roller coaster that is that can happen during menopause. Um, what I have found is when when sleep is disturbed, then you are more irritable and tired and fatigued mm -hmm. the next day and you are that affects your relationships at home at work um, you are less likely to be motivated and have the energy to exercise um, more likely to possibly make some bad diet decisions and so then you get into this habit of now you're not really being active because you're tired you might be eating more now we're now you're gaining weight you don't feel good about yourself and so you can see how this kind of spirals mm -hmm. um and even you know but when you go to bed now you're you're tired but you you know your sleep quality isn't that good um i i've seen that it it can easily impact libido because when you're in bed you really just want to sleep um and so now it's affecting intimacy and so what starts with something that is very common and you know you might not even think much of it not sleeping can quickly spiral into um, something that is really disruptive and and sucks away the your quality of life mm -hmm. um if hot flashes are what is waking you up there is so many good effective and safe treatments for hot flashes hormonal and non-hormonal. Um, so I do think if sleep is disturbed, first question that I would have is, why is it disturbed? What's waking you up? Um, and and then, then we can start to begin to provide remedies for how to get you a, a good night's sleep. Um, they did a great study a lot, uh, many years ago of women who were going through the menopause transition and we, I think we've talked about this before, so Dr. Still knows this, but this study, but um, they took women coming into a menopause clinic and they, they wrote down their list of all the, the complaints and issues they were experiencing. And the, their clinician did one thing for all those women, gave them a low dose sleeping pill. And just doing that and giving women back good sleep made everything on their list get better. So while I'm not in any way saying sleeping pills are the, what's going to fix everything, um, that, that's, not, that's not my message. But my message is that if you're having poor sleep, um, it will definitely make many parameters in your life, especially your mood, better by, by fixing sleep. Um, so, Sleep would be one thing that um, I think is, is an important issue to, to address. Um, but the second question I ask a patient who comes to me reporting mood changes 
is, has this ever happened before? If it is hormonally exacerbated or induced, then very often that woman will have a history of PMS symptoms or postpartum mood changes or postpartum depression. It's, un, it, it, it's not that it's impossible, but it's less likely that um, in, in a woman's entire life, everything has been completely, she's been stable through hormonal changes and then suddenly at menopause, um, mood changes will, will develop. So it can happen, but very often if, if hormones are the pure, are the, are the sole culprit, um, there has, there's a history of it. And that also doesn't mean that everyone that has had PMS or PMDD, premenstrual dysphoric disorder, or postpartum depression is going to have mood changes at menopause. That's not the case, but it does, um, it, it does make it more likely if, if, if that was um, part of a woman's history that the mood changes that are taking hold during menopause can be, it can be the hormones. Then we can blame it on the hormones for sure. Um, now, even in that situation where we are kind of blaming the hormones, typically, um, if we're going to start a treatment, the first thing we think of is some of the mood stabilizers. And um, the, way, the way I explain it to patients are that when you are going through the hormonal transition, the menopause transition, your hormones, which normally are predictable and, uh, and, and we can anticipate how they're going to feel at different times of the month, suddenly it's <laughs> and so it's less predictable, more erratic, and the peaks of our hormone production can sometimes exceed what we're used to in a reproductive cycle. The nadirs can persist longer and, and be lower than what we're used to. And so that all kind of can make you feel a little bit off kilter. And so when your hormones are doing the wishy, you know, the roller coaster, I think your neurotransmitters are trying to keep up and they can get a little thrown off. And so if your serotonin and dopamine are, um, are kind of being provoked and, and, and changing, then that's the, that's the role that the um, mood stabilizers can can provide. And I, I like to explain that because so often I have patients who will say, no way, I have not been on a mood stabilizer my whole life. I'm not about to start now. And I think that it's important to stress if, if mood is really a, an issue and we can't fix it in another way, then there are good therapies and most patients are not on them indefinitely. It's just during that finite transition time. Um, but they're safe and, and very effective. Now, from a behavior standpoint, um, there are probably other options that you might go to in addition or before uh, therapy. And that's pro I'm probably asking another loaded question because every uh, situation is different. But if you have a patient who is in her midlife and she is suddenly feeling an increased frequency of, of anxious feelings um, and and just a little more irritable what are some of the things that you might think of or, or go to for her i think the one one of the biggest things is is recognizing that difference and not trying to label it prematurely, right? Because we all have bad days. We all have bad weeks. Um, mm -hmm. We all have stressors that might take a little bit longer to get through. And really in those moments when that typically happens, people use their coping skills, right? Like they start to do maybe some mindfulness or some meditation, um, or they start to prioritize their ability to, to do things, right? We're not going to take on every single task because we're already feeling overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. So part of that might be to recognize one's own limits in those types of situations, just in everyday life. Because if we keep piling on, piling on, anybody would get more irritable and more overwhelmed and more anxious, right? From when our stress increases, 
we're more likely to experience symptoms of anxiety or depression because we're our system is, is just overloaded with things. Um, so I would say like always really being mindful of our ability to engage in self-care and to do those things. And self-care doesn't mean like going to a spa every weekend, right? <laughs> right? Wouldn't we love that? I, we would, but not feasible for everybody, right? So it's more so trying to find those activities of, of taking time for oneself or really trying to bring down that physiological response. So anxiety is when we're heightened, right? I must, I haven't gone through menopause. Um, hopefully that doesn't ruin my credibility with this, but no. with that, I would assume that the body experiences a lot of different sensations, um, which can be probably caused for concern, right? Of not understanding what's happening. And so really having that open dialogue with the provider of, hey, are, are, is this normal? What's happening in my body? Mm -hmm. It's making me feel like I'm going crazy or I feel really lethargic and I don't have a lot of energy. And so really trying to, I guess, like talk to try to normalize some of them because for some people, the symptoms themselves are very anxiety provoking, right? We don't like what we don't know. Right. It's scary. Um, That's a great point. So I'm just going to pause real quick because something like hot flashes can occur, can, can be experienced in different ways by by different people so many women will feel this wave of heat coming on and then they they can feel like um they feel heat coming out of their their scalp you know they they start sweating um but for other women it's this sense of doom and mm -hmm. they don't you know they don't really know that's happening or like they'll feel like their heart will start racing and something is wrong mm -hmm. um and so it could, I mean, now we are, now we are learning that a hot flash is a cardiovascular event. You can, you can measure changes that are happening in the blood vessels that precede and occur during a hot flash. So um, to your point, if this is happening and it's sort of happening below consciousness, so it's, it's maybe low grade symptoms, and you don't, you know, you feel like something's off, but you're not really sure what. I could see how then that is going to just add. It's one more thing that now you're going to be worried about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Especially anything that is, I mean, not anything. I don't want to make that generalization. But a lot of the times when people experience those types of changes, like changes in heart rate or chest pressure or things like that, we think of a cardiovascular problem right, of, oh my gosh, what's happening? Am I okay? Do I need to go to the ER? Am I having a panic attack? Am I having a heart attack? And, and so even if the symptoms don't get to that severity in terms of pain level or, or things associated with heart attacks, it can be really worrisome, especially if people have that predisposition to anxiety already, right? Right, of any type of health anxiety you're going through it. Um, so I would say, Probably some of that self care, really reflecting, try to normalize, talking to a provider, you know, that that can provide some information about yes, this is normal. Bodies go through this, and it does look different. You know, mm -hmm. one one thing I think that's important is that everyone has a good social support through this mm -hmm. time, right? But then also that could probably cause some mood symptoms because since everybody does experience it so differently, it can be hard of well, no, that wasn't what my experience was like. What's wrong with you? Right. Right. It could almost add to some of that perception of it, of it being a, a you problem rather than like a, a health and a transition and an adjustment period. Which is another really good point because um, you, you hear, I, I have a lot of women in my life, my family who said, oh, menopause, I just exercised through it and it was fine. And so then when you start experiencing symptoms that you can't exercise through, um, it makes you feel like, you know, what's going on with me? Is mm -hmm. something deeper, more, more concerning happening? Mm -hmm. um, so that is a, another good point. Mm -hmm. I think finding somebody that, that can validate and, and really empathize with that experience, because it is such a big transition, you know? And, mm -hmm. and historically, people have very specific thoughts about menopause. Um, and unfortunately, 
I'm going to make a bold statement that a lot of women's emotions are tied to menstrual cycles or this change in life. And that's not fair for any of us, right? Like we're allowed to be emotional, just like anybody else with stressors, (laughs) you know, it's not related to menstrual cycles. Right. Um, But this, this transition of also affects, I think, how people go through it with how they perceive the, Mm -hmm. the transition, right? If, if we go into any situation thinking it's going to be the worst situation ever and that it's it's terrible, then it might be that way because what we're actually looking for are those symptoms and that that difficulty, right? right? Um, not to say that it is in our thoughts completely because it's not. Like it's a hard transition and this really challenges women's perceptions of femininity and and yeah. identifiers as a, as a woman um so it can be very difficult to to work around some of those things as well yeah um but what i hear you saying is step one is just identifying what you may be feeling mm-hmm. and maybe the more challenging next question is why you might be feeling it um yeah it's it's a lot uh, while we complain about our getting our period every month and um, some of the burdens that go along with with menstruating and then being able to um, carry a pregnancy uh, i think a lot of women when it when it ends that that you know we are confronted with oh what is you know i identified as being having this potential and so it, I, it, it's a, a good point, um, which also makes me uh, makes me think about some of the other things that often are happening in our life. So, in addition to this um, this big physical change, often in a woman's forties and fifties and sixties are when. Um, when other when life is changing in other ways, so careers may be taking off, maybe changing, um, family dynamics may be changing um, after having chaotic uh, a chaotic family life and and raising a, a, raising children. Now suddenly, uh, maturing kids don't need you as you know in in that way anymore, and so. I think it can conspire to be um, to be mood changing, to say the least. Mm-hmm. Um, so, to at, at what point? What advice? Would, so, if there's a, a patient at home who's listening to this, saying, "Oh yeah, I think like that's that definitely might be somewhat what's happening to me." Um, what would be the like initial? tips you might give her and when should she seek um, some a, a consult of a PCP or a health professional, uh, mental health professional like yourself? I would say it would probably be time when things feel chaotic to the point where you can't cope, right? Where those normal strategies, let's say you're confiding in that support system that, that is truly a support system. Um, let's say you're attempting some of those self-care strategies and mood really is not changing or it's not being impacted really at all. Um, and when some of the lifestyle things that, that you might be attempting, you know, that good sleep hygiene and exercise or, or things like that, when you're trying those and they aren't as effective or you're starting to become very frustrated by them, right? Nothing okay. is more frustrating than really trying to do something and not obtaining that goal because now that could potentially cause, you know, those mood symptoms to increase. Now that irritability is back up, maybe depression because of our self-esteem, if, you know, we're not exercising or we've experienced body changes. Um, So I would say when it gets to the point of feeling really chaotic to where it feels like nobody understands, this is really frustrating. And for the first time, I feel alone, right? I think that would be a really good, good time to reach out to to somebody like you or to PCP um, just to kind of talk about that experience or to behavioral health. Um, WellSpan has a lot of what we call behaviorists that are in PCP offices, Mm -hmm. several throughout um, the county actually. And that could be a really good first step of of getting 
you know, behavioral health help, even if it's not traditional outpatient. Mm. Um, they're really brief sessions and, and they're all um, psychologists in training. So really, really good support network there. That is an excellent resource. Yes, absolutely. I encourage everyone to go to them. <laughs> <laughs> so that is something you can talk to your PCP about mm -hmm. and they can help get you um, connected with mm -hmm. a provider like that. Yep. yep. Very often, I'll have a patient who um, will, will come to me and tell me about mood changes, but her distress is due to the impact it's having on a partner. Mm. Like, I'm really irritable or I have increased anxiety and my part, like, my my husband just can't be my punching bag anymore or something you know to that effect and uh, you know when i my i have this funny story of when uh we first uh, several years ago when the midlife health and wellness center started um my uncle came up to me and said this is great that you have this for women but there really should be something for the spouses <laughs> going through, going through um, menopause with their with their wife, and I, I thought he was joking at first, but he really wasn't, and um, it it can have a really profound impact on everyone in the family. So, um, I, I I what I hear you saying, I think, is utilize the resources that you have including your your support system spouse or close friend um but then know that within your healthcare community there are people who are here and ready to help and it might be a multifactorial approach like if there's you know hot flashes or something else that's going on disturbing sleep or or if there's a need for a mood medication there's you know we have great therapies for that but there's also behaviorists who might be able to help you identify um some of the symptoms that you're having that are causing distress and maybe why they are so distressing to you mm -hmm. that they're absolutely yes but you know i think we want to provide as much support and and we're not always as known behavioral health has a stigma <laughs> Hopefully nobody in the chat has one, but if you do, it's okay. We'll work with you. Um, but we do have a lot of resources to help because we recognize, you know, this is a need. Women's health is as important as any other part of your life and, and really trying to have that support. Um, and you can use it preventatively. You know, I know that, that I just said, you know, when you start to feel alone and I almost want to take that statement back is you can come at any point really you know if there starts to be that frustration or ill irritability or that interpersonal conflict that's a really big one with mm. with mood changes in general um you know but it's not to the point of being really problematic come talk you know we can want to we would want to support you as soon as you would feel ready and if that isn't you know waiting till the last to the last point where you're like holy cow i'm gonna right Ugh. Um, yeah, you can come at any point to kind of discuss, like, how do I prepare for this? What kinds of things could I look out for? What kinds of things can I do? So, and um, that's, I'm going to kind of endorse that, what, what Dr. Still just said, because so many of, of you guys in the audience and, and my patients want to do things holistically and naturally. And mm -hmm. this is literally, the most natural holistic way to have a um, have an expert help you identify what you're experiencing and why you're experiencing it and then give you tools to help get through it. Um, there is data that even hot flashes um, there's like tapping mechanisms uh, and and other ways of trying to minimize the frequency and severity of a hot flash. Um, so that's a great, I, I like that, that tip. I really appreciate, um, you talking about minimizing the severity, right? Because I think some expectations can be that 
if they go to a treatment that it will be eliminated, mm. right? And this phase of life, as much as I wish I could snap my fingers and change all of it, it is kind of about acknowledging what's happening, trying to accept, work through it and make it tolerable, right? Mm -hmm. Like make it to the point where it feels okay, to where it's not, um, to where it's not overwhelming or to where it's not such that, I think you used the word like doom earlier, right? right. Like sense of doom. Um, because that can feel obviously really negative and overwhelming. So it could be also kind of accepting like, okay, this is part of transition. Mm -hmm. This is not the end of our life, right? It might feel that way at times because our moods, you know, go up and down or mm -hmm. like this. Um, <laughs> and so really trying to understand that concept as well. Yeah. And, uh, not to get too, uh, granola -y and, uh, <laughs> But you, I, I do think that our culture is all about fighting and resisting aging and, and maturity, right? Um, and because we identify the menopause transition as this, this like closer to the ender, mm -hmm. you know, a, a later in life transition, um, we do tend to, you know, maybe not not celebrate it the way I hope one day we can celebrate it. That it's this it's a great transition, um, and we spend a significant part of our life if we go through menopause in our early fifties, and on average, women are going to live into their eighties. That's a long time to spend in this space. Um, so we want to be thriving during it and not, you know, ignoring or trying to fight the fact that that we're in that mm -hmm. that space. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I you know, I love sex, so I got to do just a little <laughs> tiny thing about sex in okay, here. Bring it on. I got it because with moods and menopause, sex is disrupted all the time. Like and that's yeah. even yeah. with depressive symptoms or anxiety. Um, you know, outside of the, the menopausal stage of life. And with this, it can be a big, a big impact with mm -hmm. intimacy, right? First of all, our partner is irritating the heck out of us because we're just more <laughs> irritable. And the last thing we want to do is be intimate. Um, but this is also a stage of life that can be helpful in finding like good enough ways to be intimate without specific types. So, you know, maybe one, uh, sexual behavior is not comfortable anymore due to mm. vaginal dryness or things like that, that changes. Right. Um, and it's really can be a creative and fun way with your partner to try to, to expand what intimacy looks like and to use things that are helpful to, um, what's the word I'm looking for to be creative. Always down for creativeness. <laughs> yes. <laughs> not what you're um, looking for. No, but can assist you know, can okay. assist with, with some of the physical changes um, that come with menopause, especially with intimacy. So, you know, that communication with partner and really trying to work through some of those things um, rather than, you know, put it off to the side because intimacy, whether it's sex um, or whatever is encompassing or intimate behaviors, you know, such as cuddling or things like that, that can go to the wayside with mood symptoms. And, and we see it often. Um, and that's a quality of life issue. Yeah, I have to agree that a lot of patients um, feel much more comfortable talking about their low libido, um, but only when you dig a little deeper do you find that you know you're quarreling because you you know you're annoyed at everything and mm -hmm. um, and that's impact that's sort of undermined some of the the relationship, which reminds me that. In, in many ways, sex is the window into into a person's health and the relationship's health. And and so we, thank you for bringing that up. And it uh, now we have fit, uh, met my expectation that we cannot do a chat with Dr. Steele without talking about sex. <laughs> it's important. I'm going to spread all the sex education yeah. there possibly is, but I like uh, it. <laughs> Yes, and and it really truly is associated with mood. I mean, we see, we see that, you mm -hmm. know, um, because 
our bodies can't respond. So let's say somebody's going through menopause, right? Mm -hmm. And heightened anxiety. So not only is there the dryness and decreased libido, but our bodies respond differently to stress. So if we're stressed, our sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems, they don't work like this, they work like this. If we're stressed, lubrication is gonna go down, desire is gonna go down because we're in survival mode. Whereas if we're relaxed, if we're able to work through things, then we're able to actually be present and feel that. I like that. Yeah. All right. All right. Should we go to questions? Let's go to questions. Okay. So um, any questions that you may have, please feel free to um, just type them out. Okay. So uh, first question is, um, I'm almost 42. Is this too young to be going through menopause? Uh, uh, a little bit, but here's what here's what what the the reality is. The average age of menopause in the U.S. is 52 years old, which means that um, for the average woman, her last menstrual period will happen when she's around 51. Um, and so that said, what that means is for that that woman who stopped getting her period around age 51, when she was in her very early 40s is when the perimenopause likely started and hormonal changes um, started to occur. Um, now, it, a, a woman who is in her 40s can go through menopause, meaning she stops getting her period due to her ovarian reserve or egg, egg quantity just um, declining way earlier than typical. And that could, that can happen in your, your 40s, your 30s, your 20s, um, and even earlier. So it can happen at any stage, um, but it is um, typically women go through menopause in their very early 50s. It does tend to be heritable. So if you um, know when the women in your family have transitioned into menopause, that it can give you a good idea when you likely will. Um, when menopause happened earlier than the age of 40 is when we usually will investigate why it happened so early, because there can be genetic or other um, disease states that can cause a menopause to happen early. So um all right next question can the birth control pill help regulate hormonal spikes or irregularities of perimenopause yes the birth control pill will basically kind of takes over it hijacks your your ovaries and tells them to just go on vacation while the birth control hormone takes over and that in that situation, we are controlling the hormones that your body sees. And so you have um, more of a steady state kind of um, uh, hormonal level. So that can control some of the mood changes because now your hormones aren't going up and down. And it also can control your cycle because um, you can then uh, modify when you get a period, if you get a period. So there is, um, th that is a, um, sometimes a really good strategy. The other piece is that until you are completely menopausal and you're not getting your periods, you still could become pregnant. Even though our fertility declines as we get older, um, you, it can happen until you're completely menopausal. Um, and so uh, it's only contraception like birth control pills um, or the IUD that can provide, uh, that can prevent pregnancy. Using hormone therapy the way we do in menopause sometimes is not a contraception. It won't prevent pregnancy. All right, next question. I am 46 and had a hysterectomy. I feel like I was thrown into menopause instead of having a natural transition. 
how may this experience be different from someone who naturally transitioned? I'm experiencing hot flashes and sleep disruption. I'm also dealing with sadness, not sure how much is hormonal and how much is due to the trauma of having the hysterectomy due to endometriosis. That's a great question. Um, so the difference between natural menopause, which tends to happen gradually um, and gives you a little time to get <laughs> prepare and, and, and acknowledge, okay, this is really happening. Surgical menopause um, is abrupt. And so typically, anecdotally, the hormone, um, the, the symptoms can be more severe and disruptive. Now, what a lot of people don't really think about on a day, daily basis is that when you have a hysterectomy, um, we are specifically removing your uterus. And unless specifically indicated, we're, we're going to keep your ovaries um, in place. And usually, if only the uterus is removed, but the ovaries remain, um, hot flashes and menopause, typical menopause symptoms don't, don't occur. Um, however, when the ovaries are removed, then you're abruptly menopausal and the symptoms can be uh, pretty, the, the difference is that the, you have a kind of a sudden onset of severe symptoms. Um, and it, for, for, some women, it can exacerbate or kind of tip the scales and bring out a mood issue that otherwise may not have been there beforehand. Um, so that, that's a great question. I'm glad that you asked it. And I definitely would talk with your provider because even in the setting of having endometriosis, there are strategies that, um, that are often safe and, and extremely effective. So great question. If I could add on to that one really quickly, um, there can be a very quick transition in terms of mood and, and also what this might mean for you um, in terms of how you identify or perceive yourself. Um, and, you know, I've had patients that have also had like um, emergency hysterectomies due to other mm -hmm. concerns. And, and with that, we are seeing a little bit of shift in mood. And so I want to say, I think if you are feeling that sadness, it probably is a little bit normal. Your body went through a trauma. You, you went through something. Um, and so with that, trying to kind of work through that or, or having, you know, behavioral health could be helpful if you feel it's needed in, in this situation to help with that transition. Yeah, it, it's not as unusual. I'm glad you made that point. It, it's not that as unusual as you may, you may think. Um, there's, this, there's a beautiful piece of art of a woman who had a hysterectomy and, um, and, and in, in this painting, she has a, a big hole in her pelvis mm. and that's how she feels like she's, you know, this important piece of her is, is now gone. So I think sometimes we don't realize um, that, that it can elicit a lot of emotions, even if even if hormonally not a lot has changed because your ovaries are still there, um, it, just having the hysterectomy um, can, can bring on symptoms. And there's, there's it, it, yeah, very important to talk with your provider. And then on top of it, if, if your ovaries were surgically removed, that can be an abrupt change in your hormone um, environment that, that also can add to things. Mm -hmm. um, the next question is, how can we register on the behavioral health on WellSpan? It's not coming up. Do you know that answer? So you can self-refer to behavioral health. Um, you can call our um, central scheduling. The telephone number is 717-851-6340. Um, and you can make an appointment or you can also talk to your PCP and they can place an internal referral that will go to our system um, and somebody would reach out depending on like availability and insurance and stuff. So two different ways to be able to, to seek behavioral health services. And at the end of um, this webinar, Sue will put up um, contact information for Dr. Steele. Um, all right, next question is, 
will someone who has not had children experience menopause differently from someone who has given birth? Um, not too much. Uh, and it depends. I, I think it would depend if um, there was, I'm trying to think through uh, any potential differences, but um, in general, no. Um, sometimes going through a pregnancy can cause changes to the uterus that can make some of the perimenopausal symptoms a little worse. Um, one, of the, one of the examples I'm thinking of is um, a condition called adenomyosis is more common in women who have had a pregnancy before, and sometimes that can cause the menstrual cycle changes during perimenopause to be a little more intense, for bleeding to be heavier, for cramping to be a little bit uh, more intense. But other than that, in terms of hot flashes um, and other mood, mood changes uh, that, that would be not uncommon during the menopause transition, I don't think that whether or not someone's been pregnant has a big impact on that. I would say to a caveat, I think yeah. the only thing that could, not the only thing, I'm sorry, I'm going to correct myself. One factor for that could potentially be the transition of no longer being able to have children, like the behavioral mm -hmm. health component of that might be a little bit different. Yeah. If, if somebody's going through earlier menopause and hasn't gone through that stage of life or thought that they had longer in order to do that, um, to be able to might impact their perception of going through it from that cognitive self-esteem issue. Yeah, that is a good point. Um, okay, the next question. I am 57, hysterectomy with ovaries intact. How do I know when I will go through menopause or if I am now, um, I have lots of symptoms? That is not uncommon that um, a woman who has had her uterus removed, but she still has ovaries, or a woman who has had a uterine ablation, which caused her to stop getting a period, but she still has ovaries there, um, or um, even a levonorgestrel IUD or the Mirena IUD, which can cause you to stop getting periods, but your ovaries are still there. So how do you know if the ovaries are working or if you are now menopausal because you don't have the symptom of having a period to tell you. Um, so in that situation, sometimes blood work can be helpful. Although um, the reason why blood work isn't the, the end all be all or definitive answer to that question is because um, the hormones that would indicate someone's in menopause can change from, from day to day. So, um, particularly during the perimenopause transition. Um, you know, when I talked about the hormonal roller coaster, um, someone may look menopausal if we check their blood work one day, but then the next time we check it, she looks like, you know, regular reproductive age um, woman because the ovaries are allowed to do that. Um, so sometimes blood work can be helpful, but it's not the uh, sole um, uh, answer. Um, but other symptoms can be helpful. So if a patient um, is having uh, frequent hot flashes, that's usually an indication that hormonally she's not making a lot of estrogen. It's the lack of estrogen that precipitates hot flashes. Um, and then we look at some of the other symptoms and try to, it's kind of a puzzle, we put the pieces together um, in order to uh, uh, see where someone is in, in their reproductive stage. Um, which now segues, segues really nicely into the next question, which is what exactly is perimenopause versus menopause? What are, what's the difference between all the stages? Um, so from the time we get our period, um, we have entered the reproductive stage. Um, and that reproductive stage where we have the potential to become pregnant lasts until we get our last period. Um, and when you have stopped getting periods for a full 12 months, 
you are officially menopausal. But if you catch what I just said, you don't know until 12 months later that that was your last period. Mm -hmm. So it's always a retrospective diagnosis. And the most frustrating thing is you haven't gotten a period for six months, nine months, 11 months, and then you get your period <laughs> and then it, the clock starts ticking again. It has to be a full consecutive 12 months. Um, so when, when, when you've gotten that 12 months, then you're officially menopausal. Um, but for the 10 years that precede, so 10 years prior to that last final menstrual period is what we call the perimenopause transition. Um, and basically during those 10 years, your egg supply starts to decline and go away. Um, and as that egg supply declines, your brain has to work harder to try to get an egg to grow. And so all of the wishy-washy roller coaster stuff is your brain yelling at your ovaries, try to grow an egg. And sometimes none of the, no one in the, no eggs want to listen. So nothing happens. And then sometimes with enough yelling, there's an egg that's like, okay, I'll grow, I'll grow. And it grows really, really well. And you make high estrogen and you grow a cyst. And, um, and so the net result is that roller coaster. And so you can have breast tenderness, mood changes, all the things that we, that we talked about. And we talk about the perimenopause because it's such a long time, it's 10 years. We talk about that stage as early perimenopause, late perimenopause and, and mid perimenopause. Um, and it really just kind of tries to define how close you are to becoming definitively menopausal. Unfortunately, there's no good predictor. So there's no blood level or specific symptomatology that says, oh, yep, you are two years away from your last period. Um, so it can be a little frustrating in that regard, but that's, that's what I mean by some of the stages. Um, all right. So, so doctors, um, yes. obviously this is Sue. I am unable to put a question into the chat feature because I'm a host, but I, I, if you don't mind, I did want to um, get a little bit. I, I really appreciate that you said it's important to seek help when your holistic coping tools are not working. Um, but I'd like you to be a little more give some more ideas about what those tools would be. I know for myself, um, I started exercising regularly and that made a big difference. And I also noticed that I needed to change my diet. I, I think it's really important to be aware of what can trigger a mood change. Um, it's funny because I discovered that excess sugar can send me into a spiral of depression who would have thought so mm -hmm. I like I mean we're supposed to cut out processed sugar anyway but that just gave me another reason too so of course exercise and, and diet everybody knows those are those are given for everything but also I think like you talked about life changes this is the age where a lot of us go through the empty nest syndrome that is really hard. And mm -hmm. I, I think it's important to acknowledge that and, and to perhaps find a new hobby, a new pleasurable activity. It number one helps to fill that void and can also be a distraction. Um, and as for when, when you're having trouble sleeping, breathing exercises, yoga, things like that, I'm just offering these as a voice of experience. Yeah and just wanted to share. You're speaking Dr. Steele's love language right now, <laughs> right? Absolutely. The, the other thing I would say is, is, you know, finding hobbies or something like that, but also allowing this space to, this time to kind of redefine potentially some relationships, you know? How do we reconnect with partners? How do we communicate in a different way? Because a lot of the times when, when there are 
families involved, um, you know, children and schedules and, and that empty nest. It's how do we how do we fulfill our days now, right? Because our purpose has has shifted a little bit. Um, and so not only through hobbies, but how do we communicate that with our partners too? I, I find a lot of people have difficulties when they are going through this stage of life and trying to understand what's happening with their mood and their bodies, that um, how we communicate things changes very drastically, right? Mm -hmm. Instead of, I'm feeling overwhelmed, I need help. It's you never take out the trash and it's irritating me, <laughs> you, you know, as, as an example. And so part of that might also be focusing on on how to express ourselves to help or have our partners help support us or have our friends support us or have our um, have our family there just as like a, a small caveat of, of shifting some of the communication as well you know it's not always behaviorally it can be cognitively um, you know sometimes there's brain fog that comes along with with feeling mm -hmm. really scattered and things like that and sometimes that self-care is trying to find strategies to help decrease the stress within the day, not necessarily change it, right? We might not be able to change our responsibilities, but we might be able to find ways to help reduce the emotions that are associated with, with how many tasks are on our plate, if that makes sense. I love that. Yeah, acknowledging and accepting and not fighting the transition mm -hmm. or what's going on. And communicating. We typically don't communicate the best. Mm -hmm. Me as well. I mean, I'm literally a psychologist and there are some days where my communication is not the best. Um, and, and that's part of that work through, I think, of, of finding healthy ways to work through some of the transitions with, with the people that are also affected by them. Yeah. Gardening is also a great hobby. Yes. And that's <laughs> perfect timing. <laughs> order, yeah. order everyone's seedlings. <laughs> All right. Well, ladies, it was so nice to spend this evening with you and Dr. Steele. You are, it's always so good to talk with you. Thank you for everything you do for the women and men, but um, for our, the ladies in our community, we are very appreciative of your help. And Without further ado, I will um, say good night to everyone. Thank you again for joining us. And I hope that you will uh, join us for our next menopause chat. Have a good evening.